Well, thank you guys. You, you, I think you found your, yourself in the right place. Thank you, uh, Brooke and the folks at, at Oak for having me. Um, so my bio was shared. I'd like to just share a little bit more about what brought me here and how did I find my, my space, myself. Um, hanging out with farmers a lot. My, my friends and family are just like, yeah, Cass is always talking about farming and food. Um, I am a proud Kentuckian. I grew up in Richmond, Kentucky, where my, my mother and her uh, nine siblings grew up on a farm in Peyton Town. Uh, when my mother talks about um, her rearing, she says that, you know, we were diversified because we had to be. She talks about, you know, reminisces about uh, breakfast in the morning. She said we'd have at least two or three meats in the morning to make sure that everybody got fed and um, that our garden looked like the Garden of Eden. And so um, that has kind of always been in my, my system. When I was probably in middle school or our first part of high school, our family lost our family farm. Um, my great uncle was shot and killed by his wife. And we don't really talk about it. <laughs> um, but we, we do talk about the fact that there was domestic violence and it, it just happened. And so it happened, uh, the farm changed hands to uh, my younger cousin who sold the farm to the white guy down the street that my great grandfather said he didn't want to own the farm because that guy was a nasty man. And, um, and so when I graduated from undergrad, so fast forward, I'm, I'm in Louisville, I attend the University of Louisville and decided that I don't want to teach middle school math and English after <laughs> substituting at the school that my kids have, been go have gone to, which is <laughs> it's just crazy. Um, I found myself looking for a job. And I found, uh, I, at the time, the city of Louisville was going through merger. Our city and county governments were merging. And there were folks that were really concerned about what merger would do to particularly um, black political representation um, and, and all the things that we've seen change in our city. Uh, and that's for another talk. But there were folks that were organizing around what, what should be um, a people version of, of merger. And they were organizing, they were meeting at my church, and I met a young woman uh, who worked for Community Farm Alliance. Uh, are there any CFA members here? Yay. So you all should all become members of CFA. I'm, I'm gonna do some, a bunch of plugging uh, during my talk, and it's, it's shameless. Um, but Community Farm Alliance is a statewide grassroots organization, membership um, organization. It's been around since the 80s. Um, and, so, and it was organized to support farmers. Um, the first thing that, that CFA members did uh, was, was start a, a suicide hotline in the 80s because farmers were literally committing suicide and trying to figure out how to stay on their farms. And when I joined the, the organization, the organization has done a lot of policy work um, across the state supporting small, small farmers. One of the biggest uh, wins that CFA um, holds dear to our hearts is the passage of House Bill 611, which put half of, of Kentucky's master tobacco settlement funds back into hands of, of farmers. So back in the 80s, um, you should Google this. It's a quick two minute video. Just Google um, uh, uh, tobacco CEOs testifying in Congress. So you get these really old videos in the 80s of uh, these CEOs lying to Congress about the addiction um, of, of tobacco. And so they, they lied, they got caught lying. The attorney general sued them and sued them for the, the Medicaid and, and, and healthcare costs. And the states won. And in Kentucky, members of Community Farm Alliance and other folks across the state thought it was important that if we are going to, if, if Kentucky farmers aren't getting what they used to from, from tobacco, um, and we can talk about all the reasons why, trade policies and people understanding uh, the, the, the negative benefits of, of using tobacco. Um, it changed our, our economy to some degree. And so CFA members and other folks were like, if, if we're not gonna have this as a benefit, what more can we do? We wanna keep these 85, 88,000 farms as, a, as an asset in our state, what more can we do? And so we put forth, CFA put forth a vision for locally integrated food economies. We called it LIFE um, when, when I first got started. And so with that um, passing of House Bill 611, the, um, the Kentucky Agriculture Development Board, you guys maybe have heard of, of, of that, and then you've got county councils. So that money was distributed 
uh, or was intended to be distributed in Kentucky to really support um, the, the changing and the transition of our agricultural economy to do other things. And we were excited about those other things being food, being food, healthy food grown uh, for our people, by our people, and making sure that those of us who, who have limited access to food um, get, get that money or, or benefit from, from that. And so um, early in my 20s, I, I got the bug early on about local food system development, and I've been on that track um, ever since. Um, I started working in the Portland neighborhood in West Louisville, organizing a farmer's market. I had literally two weeks to find a location. Uh, my colleague was organizing farmers and farmers who were CFA members, you know, wanting to extend, expand their markets. And the first thing I had to do was find a location and be sure that we had the, the, neighbor, the, the neighbors organized to um, support, support the market. So that was my entree into this work uh, for the last 20 years or plus. Um, I've been working in the throes of food system development, um, community development, um, trying to strengthen our democracy, and it landed me uh, to be interested or to learn more about our energy economy. And um, I've come to see and understand that co-ops are the ways in which, at least one of the ways, one of the stronger ways for us to build power um, and to reorganize our, our economy. So what are co-ops? Oh, I should start. Oh, my slides are not fancy. They're like totally bullet points. So <laughs> I'm an orator, not, not much of a presenter thing, but there are some notes here. So um, co-ops, just generally, the basic kind of definition is that they're democratically um, organized and controlled um, economic entities, businesses. Um, they're controlled by the people who um, become members and they have to, the, the co-ops have to uh, respond to the values and the goals of, of the owners. When um, I first got into co-op development, so my presentation will be a little bit about my story and then a little bit about the power co-op, so just bear with me. Um, so I started organizing a co-op um, after learning about how co-ops have been used. So one of the first things is that co-ops are tested and they're proven to work. They have been the tool that people have used in our communities for, for centuries. And particularly as a black woman, what I have learned is that we have had to pull our money together to do the things. Um, when we first started working, our group, we first started working, uh, I, a girlfriend gave me the book called Courage by Jessica Gordon Nimhart. It's a history of co-op development in, in black communities. And essentially what that's, that book is, it's really a, um, a rehistory of, of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois' work um, in the early 1900s around um, co-ops. He did a lot of research there. And when I was with CFA, and CFA started thinking about how do we support um, new farmers, it's the same kind of language. It's the, the work that W.E. Du Bois did, um, the work that Jessica Nimhart has rediscovered and, and published is similar to um, what I hear when I think about, when I hear people about supporting entrepreneurs, whether they're folks in the city or they're farmers. Um, people need access to capital. People need mentors. Um, they need uh, support with just, you know, learning and capacity building, access to land and some control of the market. Um, and in our work collectively, that market is like, you know, logistics and aggregating products, whether it's the supply, the things that you need, your inputs, or whether it's, you know, actual, the product. It's, you know, all of those things have been um, challenges and opportunities to grow local food systems, to support entrepreneurs, to support, to support um, growing farmers. And so in that book, um, you know, what I learned is for, for black people, we put our money together and organized our talent and time to take care of each other when we got sick. And then that became, you know, these mutual aid activities that we would do. And then um, that became um, us burying each other 
and starting insurance companies and then banks. And then integration happened and all the stuff went to hell. <laughs> uh, you know, we got access and, and then our business is closed. Um, and I think about one of my sheroes, Fannie Lou Hamer um, from Rueville, Mississippi, and uh, the work that she did to organize her community, um, the sharecroppers um, in, in her community to, to grow food and to have access to land and how that work um, in transition to democracy work, um, getting the power to vote and fighting for that. Um, if Fannie Lou Hamer could organize her, her neighbors to collectively put their money together to buy hogs, certainly I can figure out <laughs> how um, our community can, can get a grocery store that we, that we deserve. Um, a lot of you guys talked about uh, Good Foods Co-op. I remember when Good Foods Co-op had like, they still have a, a daily kind of thing, but they used to make these awesome peanut butter and chocolate uh, milkshakes and they don't make them anymore but it was like the best milkshake that I've had. And I think it's because of the ingredients, like the quality of all the stuff. Um, Co-ops, um, they become a beacon in the community, a gathering place. And from, I think you were, you were mentioning this when we first started our organizing, people came to us because they were like, well, when I used to live here and I used to live here, this is what, you know, this is where I shopped. And I was amazed that when I came to Louisville, we didn't have one. So, they're entities, they're businesses that have been around for a very long time, um, and they're, they still do operate in our communities. Um, there are co-ops that operate that we don't know that they're co-ops, um, but they are you know, collectively and democratically owned um, and controlled. Um, so when we started our, our organizing around the Louisville Community Grocery, we were pissed off <laughs> and fed up and, and pretty upset that grocery stores in our community were closing in a community where um, there are up to you know, 60,000 people in uh, maybe three mile, square mile area? I don't know, don't quote me on that. But you know, thinking about 60,000 people is a pretty sizable county in Kentucky. Um, that's a community of, of nine neighborhoods or 12 neighborhoods um, downtown in Louisville, that these grocery stores continued to close. We kept seeing headlines of grocery stores closing, like five within about 18 months or two years in our community, and nothing happening. Um, and at the time, I was kind of starting consulting on my own. Um, I was catering out of my house. So as a young child, I've always been excited about food and about the built environment. I thought I was either gonna be a chef or an architect and I became an urban planner, which I think is a good <laughs> combination of those things. Um, so when my kids were little, uh, I started catering when I was laid off from, from Louisville Metro government. And I was just catering around my home. I was catering to like nonprofits or just people that I knew. I didn't market much of my business. Um, and I, I was like, I've, I've, I'm gonna cook myself into a building was, was my goal. Or I'm gonna go to grad school, That's, that was my thing. And so I started the cook myself in the building first. And um, my business got to a point where it was really hard to have my family's food in the refrigerator and the food that I had for my catering job. And so I decided to start looking for places. I got college debt, I didn't even own my own car, certainly didn't own my own house. Um, and was you know, really taken care of by my partner. I didn't have any assets to get anything. And so I convinced a guy in my neighborhood who owned a building um, to give me an option. Give me an option on the building and let me see what I can do with it. And he did, and I hosted uh, an open house. And I had these nice pictures of what I thought was gonna happen in the building. I just really wanted a kitchen in the back of the building. There was some space in the front that I was like, oh, it'd be cool if there was food retail um, and a couple apartments. And 40 people came and they were interested in talking about a co-op. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, y'all should do that. <laughs> and they were like, you know, let us know when the next meeting is. And I, there, there is no next meeting. I'm trying to get money for my kitchen. And so that turned into, you know, six years later, here I am um, 
we have uh, we we founded the Louisville Association for Community Economics as um, a nonprofit cooperative developer, and um, Lace's job is to support our community in learning about cooperative economics and then supporting members of our community who want to start a co-op. And the first co-op that we're starting is the Louisville Community Grocery. So we incubated, um, incorporated, excuse me, LCG, the, the, the business in, in 2019. And so we started in 2016. I'm getting to this point. <laughs> um, we were literally just meeting in each other's kitchens. Uh, there was um, a family. So one thing about co-ops is that people come and go. And it's a big leadership development thing. That's the biggest thing. It's about self-governance. How do you organize yourselves to do this thing that you've all committed to? You've got um, values that you share and you're committed to getting this thing. Your work is organizing yourselves to do the thing. It's not that you don't have the power or access to the capital. You'll get that if you can figure out how to, con how to organize yourselves to do the thing. And so we started at the Symes, that's it's a couple that lived in the Portland neighborhood, just meeting at their homes uh, for a year and um, hearing stories about people going to other co-ops and um, hearing from jaded uh, general managers from grocery stores, it's like, you're not gonna make any money, this is not gonna work. <laughs> um, or, or listening to farmers complain about um, being a part of a co-op and not working. And then hearing the excitement of people who are just like, you know what, I'm fed up um, with a Kroger. I want another option. And, and so for two years, we committed to just being in space together. We kept meeting at the Symes. And then finally we were like, oh, well we should tell people what we're doing and start meeting across the community. And so we did that. We met in neighborhoods that, that recently lost a grocery store or who had already been practicing uh, cooperative economics. Has anybody heard of New Roots and the Fresh Stops? Anybody operate or own a CSA or been a member of a CSA? So if you have not heard of Fresh Stops, Fresh Stops are like a modified CSA. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my CFA days. So I, grad I finished working at CFA and I went to grad school. And when I left, um, Karen Makowitz, if you don't know her, she's the founder of, of, of New Roots. She came on staff and um, the, the organi organization and community members and farmers were trying to figure out what else we could do beyond farmer's market. So started a farmer's market in the Portland neighborhood, started one in uh, Smoketown in Shelby Park the next season. And um, right before I left to go to grad school, we organized a, um, a, a community food assessment and the community food assessment basically published what people knew in their communities. This is our experience not having food. This is our dreams for the things that we wanted, wanted to see happen. And when Karen came on staff, um, she began working with young people in the community who were um, entrepreneurial in spirit, who really wanted to get food in their neighborhood, um, and who were working with a couple of our superstar farmers. Anybody know Ivor Chalkowski? Um, he was one of our, our lead uh, farmer members. And um, as much as they were trying to do it, it just, it, it didn't make sense. So we were getting, they were buying food from Ivor. And if you know who Ivor is and his products, like they're like, they're like the supreme quality and price, right? So the young people are getting food from Ivor and then trying to resell it in the Victory Park neighborhood. And if you know anything about Louisville and West Louisville, it ain't gonna work. It's just not gonna work. And so we, we, had this, we had this challenge of having um, these superstar, very innovative farmers, very niche farmers um, with just a little bit of supply. And we had all these people who had very limited amount of money um, who wanted access to these products. And so Karen came on and was like, this, the economics behind this isn't working. Like there's no way that we're gonna get Ivor any money or that people in the Victory Park neighborhood are gonna be able to afford this food. Um, at a scale that's gonna make sense. And so she visited um, a gentleman named Maurice Smalls in Cleveland, Ohio, who introduced her to this modified CSA. And so uh, with that was born the Fresh Stops, where people of all incomes come in and they put their money on the table and uh, the, the Fresh Stop organizers come together in what we call do uh, Fresh Stop math. We count our money, figure out how much money we have, 
and we talk to our farmers about what they have, and then we figure out how we can buy between eight and 10 um, veggies, fruits or veggies, every, every two weeks. So um, New Roots had been doing these uh, fresh stops in neighborhoods in West Louisville and downtown for f several years. And so we knew that there was already a base of folks who understood cooperative economics just from the fresh stops. And so we chose those neighborhoods and the neighborhoods who had limited access to food to begin talking to them. Again, the co-ops are people powered. So even though we were kind of the organizers and leaders, um, we all didn't live in those neighborhoods collectively. And we knew that the business that we were creating was, was to benefit the folks that are in the neighborhood. So we should be in community and talking to them. And so we spent another year just circling those communities, going to meetings, um, going to people's neighborhood meetings. We'd have our own meetings. We'd just show up and talk to people about our vision and ask them to add to it. And when we incorporated, um, there were some of us who, cho who chose to be on, on the nonprofit side and others that chose to, to be, become leaders in the co-op. And um, without being experts <laughs> in, in grocery store development, um, some of us had been experts in kind of building organizations. Um, we, we moved down this path. We didn't care that none of us had operated a grocery store before. We didn't care that hardly any of, any of us were farmers. Um, we knew that we were all consumers and that we wanted to put our money, our talents, our time, use our networks to, to, move, this, to move this business. Um, when we organized the co-op, we wanted the co-op to be multi-stakeholder, just meaning we wanted the co-op owners to um, be of different classes. So we have a class of co-op owners that are consumers and then a class of co-op owners that are workers. So there was somebody who said that they work um, in, in uh, they, they identified as a worker. Um, we thought it was important that we shared that power with workers um, in that are gonna be working and operating the co-op, as well as those of us who wanted to put our money in to have this, have this awesome system. And once the business opens, um, we don't have workers, because we don't have a business yet, but uh, we have the business, but it's not oper operable. So once the business opens, I think a year in, the owners or the workers will be able to buy into the co-op and have uh, board seats and, and operate in, in, in um, cooperation with those of us who are consumer, consumer owners. We have talked a little bit about um, our vendors, so our farmers, like we have farmer owners. We have over 500 owners right now at the co-op and we have a lot of producers that are owners. Um, the co-op will have to decide how, how we continue that relationship if we want to, to put vendors or have some of our farmers also as a, a class of owners. Um, but that's how, that's how we have it organized this, thus far. Which brings me to my next point. So, um, I think it was you. There was a, somebody talked about uh, farmers being independent and uh, wanting to do things on their own. And I can dig it. I've been consulting for some time. I don't think I'll ever have another boss. She's gonna be bad as hell if I do. Like, she's gonna be like the smartest lady in the world if I decide to work for somebody again. Um, but as a consultant, I have come to understand that I do need help. I can't do it on my own. I hate admin work. I hate it, absolutely hate it. Um, and so it's been important to me to be in community with other consultants that are similar, that have similar values, that maybe have a similar client base, um, so that I can share some responsibilities and successes with them. And it also means that um, I've got to work in collaboration with them, even though I'm my own independent consultant, it means that I'm still working in a team. Um, if we're serving the same client, we've got to work together. And that's what I found um, that's powerful with co-op, that you come with your own stuff. You come with your own vision of what you want the co-op to be. You come with your own needs. Um, what I like about co-op development is it allows us to have some transparency in our vulnerability. Like this is why I'm here. This is why I'm showing up and these are the things that I need. If I'm gonna put $150 in, this is what I need it to do. We don't have to hide it. We can just be straight up 
Like, I'm joining this co-op because I really want the freshest green beans in the world every, every month. I want to be able to go get, get those green beans. Um, and there may be somebody in the co-op who hates green beans. <laughs> they don't even want to smell the green beans when they come, come to the, to the co-op. And so there's, you know, there's some, some compromising that has to happen. And you can own and, and hold your own values and also open up space and opportunity um, for others to share. Uh, since I've been doing this work, I've become a, <laughs> an owner of um, a co-op. Uh, and at the end of my slide, I'll, I'll have my contact information. So Columinate um, was a business, a regular business, consulting business firm uh, when we first started that were supporting um, grocery co-ops. They were called um, CDS Consulting. And since we've started our work, CDS Consulting has become Columinate, which is a co-op of cooperative, cooperative development consultants. I know that's a lot to cover. So there are a bunch of us who actually consult with people who want to start co-ops. And we've organized ourselves to have our own co-op. Um, and uh, we, so I have grocery store, um, um, let me back up. So we, can't, we got Columinate, we as the Lace and the Louisville Community Grocery, we were able to apply for, some, uh, for a grant with the reinvestment fund. Um, and I'm gonna go down the weeds really quickly on this. So this is the power, like people power. So since I've been doing my organizing work when I first got started, there was some awesome and cool things happening in Philadelphia around like supporting the, the bodegas. So places like Philly and New York, have been having food access issues like for some time. Like it's, our food system's jacked up. It's hard to get stuff in and out. Let's just simplify it that way. And so in Philly, some smart folks were like, we've got these bodegas in the community. They don't sell the best stuff. Let's figure out how to get food in the bodegas. And so they did. They got some money. I convinced folks that let's try this. And it worked. And it worked so well, they were able to convince the state of Pennsylvania to pilot um, a program that was putting money into communities across Pennsylvania to support grocery store development. And then that worked. So much so, the congressional leaders in Pennsylvania connected with folks in New, in New York and California and all the other places where people were doing exciting food stuff and said, hey, we should, we should do something about this. We should put some more, some more money into a program like this. And so the federal government started a program called the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. And it's an initiative that is supported by the USDA, I think HUD and the Department of Labor. And they collectively um, are funding this program. And then the reinvestment fund is the conduit. So the reinvestment fund is putting that money out in communities. And so they had a grant application for startup grocery stores to apply for technical assistance support. And LACE and the Louisville Community Grocery um, won a $30,000 uh, technical assistance grant that just meant that the reinvestment fund was gonna pay Columinate or some other, one of their other contractors to work with us and support us. We are a very DIY group. We are nerds about everything. <laughs> And we don't want anybody to feel like that they're doing something for us. We want to learn. We want to add um, our superpowers to it. We want to, you know, we want it to be of us, for us. Um, and knowing that we don't know everything, we've got to get some help. Um, and so when we work with consultants, we're very clear about like, this is what we need from you and this is how we want to work with you. And when we got this op opportunity, we were pretty clear that we, even though the $30,000 wasn't hitting our bank account, it was going straight to Columinate, we wanted to get some of that in-house capacity and, and save it here. And so we were able to broker a relationship with Columinate through me as our leader, um, for me to be kind of a part of, of, of the consultant team. And it turned into this, um, I, I was called it speed dating with the, the principal of Columinate, who um, convinced me that I could support other startups that we had done enough great work, even though our store wasn't open yet, um, that we were innovators enough to, to be able to support others. And so um, I believed him <laughs> and, and bought into the co-op. And now I have clients um, in the south side of Chicago, uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, 
a small town called Talbotton, Georgia, which is a very interesting little place, um, and maybe a new one in Newark. And so now I'm supporting other startup, startup um, grocery clients. And in that, I'm not an expert on a pro forma <laughs> or a market study. And right now, like, we're having a whole thing about market studies. I can go in the weeds and out of the weeds about the challenges of, of market study um, for, for these kinds of businesses. Um, but I, as the, the planning and strategy consultant, have to work with my colleagues who are experts in market study and the pro forma or who have been um, uh, board chairs of their co-op who can really lead our, our clients through the governance pieces, um, folks who have marketing and accounting expertise that I don't have. Um, but I've got to check my own self in order to be able to work with my colleagues to transfer that information to our, our team. And we do it collectively together, even though we all are different and have different expertise, we come together to, to support our clients in that way. And as, as members of, co of a co-op, you have to, again, thank you so much, bring your stuff, your, your values, your needs, um, but also be able to hear and respect those of your, of your fellow um, owners and members and be able to work accordingly. The last point I wanna make before we have a discussion is that I didn't understand risk and mitigation of risk much when I got into this work. I understood it just from a planning perspective. Um, again, I came to this work not having owning a car or a house or knowing anything hardly about um, business development. But when I started fundraising and talking to um, folks who have hold the purse strings, people kept wanting to talk about risk. This is a risky business. These are risky neighborhoods. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Like, really, what does that mean? Like, it's risky to not do anything, which is what I, that's, that's what I've been saying back. So use that. It's risky for us not to try. Like, we've been doing the same thing for a very long time. We should, we should just try something else. Um, but I couldn't have done this alone. And it's actually really been hard as a black woman to be the leader because it has meant that we haven't gotten some support from some people because of that. Because you got the loud mouth black girl who's, who's leading it. And it's okay. It just means that those aren't our right partners. But my ace in the hole is Amanda Fuller. She and I are like yin and yang. If she's having a bad day, I'm having a great day. And, and if I'm the tiger, then she's the nice puppy that day. Like we just... We balance each other out. Um, and our co-op leaders are from across the community. Um, they are, or we are, um, we're diverse in all the ways. It's intergenerational. We have different cultures, um, racially and, and otherwise. Um, certainly different economics, um, people's socioeconomic status in, in the world is so, certainly across the map um, when we look at our 500 owners. A lot of us live in different places. One thing that has been exciting when we first started, and even now, is that I remember, I guess like year two, and we we're traveling around the neighborhoods, having meetings in different neighborhood spaces. And I remember us having a meeting in Shawnee. And if you know anything about Louisville, the, the geography of, of Louisville, the Shawnee neighborhood is like as far as west, like the Shawnee and the Portland neighborhood is like as far as west you can go before you hit the Ohio River. So it's like deep in, it's like deep in the hood. <laughs> and the street that we were on was like, it's one way street, like it's really deep in Shawnee. And probably two thirds of the people were white at that meeting. And I was like, why, how they even find us down here? Like, because they're so, like our community is really segregated and people don't travel a lot to, in different places. And I, and, and they came and they showed up and they shared and they listened. Um, and it was a point for me that, okay, we're on to something here, that we, we have a vision, we have a thing that a lot of people can be a part of um, and uh, that we're gonna keep, keep getting different support. And we have. 
And the co-op itself is, has been black led from, from, the, from the start. The LACE supporter, the, the LACE organization is, um, the leadership is probably more um, racially mixed. I'm thinking about the board structure, I'm <laughs> sorry, the board members. Um, but it's been beautiful to see us check ourselves, check our privilege, check our space. Um, like when we're making decisions, you know, whose voice matters most um, and how do we choose to do that? And knowing that we have to do that, we have to, going back to the other slide, we have to be culturally diverse. We have to understand and listen to each other so that together we can do this business. So I, I, there's some meetings I can take by myself. There's other meetings that Amanda and I have to take together. And there are some meetings that I shouldn't go to at all. <laughs> people don't, some like, no, Cass is gonna kill the deal. So we gotta send somebody else in. Um, but we've learned how to do that um, because I couldn't, I couldn't open the grocery store by myself. Um, Amanda has spent a lot of time in the weeds on a lot of different things. Uh, we can't, there's, you know, the startup of a business, you, you're, you're going through that right now. You've, there's a lot, you guys all know that there's a lot to manage. And as a farmer, you, you, you're clearly, you can understand that. Imagine having um, a family of, of eight or nine and everybody's willing and able and everybody can work on the farm. Like you've, you got a system down, right? Like you can really do some stuff. Oftentimes it's just a few of you. And so what we've learned is that by having a business that's cooperatively owned, that people all share in uh, the risk of putting our money on the table, we also share in the mitigation of that risk um, because we're all learning together. We're all bringing our talents, our resources, our networks um, to, to the situation so that yeah, it might be a little risky for us to take that, out that loan, but because we've developed relationships, maybe we don't have to take out as many loans as we, as we have to. Maybe we're able to operate our business or start our business with cash and we go to the lender, we're only gonna take out $200,000. That's a real thing. Like we, are, we need about nine and a half million dollars for the whole project. And our pro forma says, or <laughs> our um, sources and uses document says that we're only gonna take out $200,000 in loans from like a traditional lender, which we'll probably do with CDFI. But that means that we're banking on the fact that our relationships, um, the power that we're bringing, our ability to get other people to believe in our mission um, is gonna work. And that, that when we go to that loan officer, they're gonna have no problem <laughs> you know, giving us the $200,000 loan because we've been able to convince a local philanthropy convince our owners um, to give us uh, more than $150 because we're collectively mitigating that risk because we're all gonna share in um, the responsibility and power of the co-op together. Um, I'm, I'm gonna stop there and invite you all to ask questions or make comments um, or share other things that you're thinking about as you um, grow your business or think about your own, own communities around the power of co-ops. <laughs>